Take with me your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Micah, the little book of Micah in the chapter 6, and we're going to read together from the verse 1. Micah in the chapter 6. If it's a book you struggle to find, well, perhaps a more well-known one beside it is Jonah. And so if you find Jonah, it's right next door. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Micah in the chapter 6, and let's read together from the verse 1. The word of God says, Hear ye now what the Lord saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of the servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted about Balaam, the son of Beor, answered from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord, and by myself before the high God shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oils? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod who hath appointed it. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick and smiting thee and making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. And sweet wine, but shall not drink wine. For the statutes of Omri are kept and the works of the house of Ahab and ye walk in their counsels that I should make thee a desolation and the inhabitants thereof a hissing. Therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing even to the public reading again of his word. As we come to consider this uh, prophet Micah this morning, we consider one who is truly a unique prophet. For as we consider Bible study, and indeed our routine Bible study, is often overlooked and scantily passed by. But Micah is one who ministered at the same time period of Isaiah, of as Amos, and indeed as Hosea. And he's regarded as a man who had a high view of the holiness of God, and therefore with a tender heart, faithfully ministered a difficult message to the nation. His name simply means who is like the Lord. And truly if we were to survey his ministry and his message, we would see that he more than lived up to his name. For in the challenges that he issued and in the word that he brought, he sought to honor God and faithfully proclaim the majesty and glory of his name. He was faithful to the God who called and commissioned him, but he was faithful also to the people to whom he was called. He preached, he ministered, he gave his message with their very best interests at heart. And so he fulfilled all that the Lord had called him to do. Micah ministered in the days of kings Jotham, Ahaz, and indeed Hezekiah. And much of his ministry was directed to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. But nevertheless, there was also those parts that were applicable to the northern kingdom. What's interesting about the ministry of Micah is that during the period of his preaching, it was during these days that the Assyrians came and carried into captivity the northern kingdom. And all that he and other prophets had spoken of and indeed had foretold came to pass amongst the people who were assembled as part of that ten tribe northern kingdom. Indeed, as Micah begins his message, he does so against the backdrop of a kingdom who never knew a godly king. But rather, from the days of Rehoboam, began that downward spiral into idolatry and immorality. 
which ultimately led to the manifestation of the judgment of God upon them. Now, if you come back with me to the first chapter of Micah, we see that he begins his ministry with this very much at the forefront of his mind. It tells us there, the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And so we see all that we've just mentioned confirmed there in the first verse. Micah's the messenger. He comes with a little background given to us of his family, of his upbringing. But nevertheless, he comes in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he comes with a dual focus upon the kingdoms of the north and the kingdom of the south. And he says, hear all ye people, hearken to earth and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Again, confirming even that the view, the high view of holiness that was resplendent throughout the ministry. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. The mountains shall be molten under him. The valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire. And as the waters that are poured out down a steep place. For the transgression of Jacob is all this. For the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Now, Samaria was the erstwhile uh, capital of the northern kingdom. Remember, the capital of Israel, as God ordained it to be, was Jerusalem. But when the kingdom separated into the north, into the south, Jerusalem, of course, being found by location and also desire in the southern kingdom, Samaria then was taken to be the capital city of the newly established northern kingdom. And so as the Lord commissions this man to bring the message onto his people, he says, where is the focus? Where is the evidence of your backslidings, of your transgression against the Lord? Is it not to be found in Samaria? Is it not to be found in that place of power, that place of prominence in the nation? He says, what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? And so he's looking both at the capital city, that focal point of the northern kingdom, the capital city, the vocal point of the southern kingdom. And in both of these cities, he's identifying those things which are against God, against the teaching of God. And this is why God has called him. This is why God has sent him. This is why he comes to deliver a message unto the people of impending judgment, of impending doom. In verse 6, he says, therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field. We see there, of course, the notice given to the people of the form that God's judgment would take and the pattern that would first come to the northern kingdom. And then if the southern kingdom were unwilling, unrepentant, it too would follow. Judgment would come to the south as well as the north. But he says, therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field, as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof, and all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire. All the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the isles, for her wound is incurable. And God here is proclaiming a judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's saying to them, you have passed that point of no return. There's no turning back. My mind is set. My mind is steadfast. Judgment will fall. But he says, for it has come unto Judah. There's time, there's space, there's room for Judah to turn to repent. He has come even on to the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. And so Micah begins his ministry as given to him by God, this challenging ministry. And his focus is upon correcting the slide that is evident amongst the people of Judah. He's using Israel, he's using the northern kingdom as the example as that a, p- a pattern that has been established even to and turn their back from and to repent of. He's seeking to lead the place or the people to the place of a right fellowship and indeed right worship of God. And surveying Micah's life, we see that how God then used this man to bring about a revival amongst the southern kingdom, the people of the southern kingdom. It was in the days of Hezekiah. We studied Hezekiah several weeks ago in our prayer meeting. And so we saw how that even in those days there was a return unto the Lord. 
how that he observed the Passover, how that emissaries were even sent into the northern kingdom to invite the people to come and to reestablish in their hearts, to reestablish in their lives that right view of God and that right worship of God. But this was all a direct result of the ministry of Micah. And God blessed this man and God blessed his message and God used him as a human instrument to turn the people from impending doom to that place of blessing where they could once again bask in the favor of God. We all, of course, know that it's short-lived. Micah himself prophesies of the fall of Judah eventually to the Babylonian Empire in the chapter 4 of his prophecy in the verse 10. And as we have looked at already in the book of Lamentations, we know that that came to pass. Micah predates Jeremiah by approximately 100 years. But he ministers to a people who did turn, but nevertheless the next generation didn't heed, didn't hear. And so God's judgment did ultimately fall upon the southern kingdom as well. We've looked already at those times whenever Jeremiah laments even the mistakes of the people of Judah, their hard-heartedness and not seeking to fully implement and apply all that God taught, even through his servant Micah. One truth that we learn from Micah's life as we look from this, at this man from beginning to end, as we consider this book from beginning to end, is simply this. Success isn't guaranteed in the short time. Micah, we believe, ministered somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Many of uh, the commentators would settle in a period of about 27 years where he is involved in this public ministry for God. But during that time, he labored long and indeed many hard days, not seeing fruit, not seeing the result that his heart desired. And so he reminds us, of course, of the great truth that anything meaningful done for God will take time. We live, of course, in an age where we want everything now. And I, like no doubt many of you, struggle with the curse of impatiently waiting for a move of God, impatiently waiting for God to do something. But Micah reminds us that what we yearn for, what we pray for, what we labor for, may take years to accomplish. And God is not slack concerning his promises. And so God's word reminds us that even in days whenever it seems nothing is happening, whenever, of course, the, the times are difficult and the hearts are hard, that we must not be weary in well-doing. For we will reap if we faint not. Micah's message is twofold. It's, of course, twofold in its focus, but it's twofold in its emphasis as well. We've looked at the focus, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, but the emphasis comes to us uh, very clearly even as we read through this little book of prophecy. On the one hand, he continually and consistently reminds the people that judgment will come for their sin, for their hard-heartedness, for their backslidings even from God and from his ways. And so as he continues his ministry, he saw in his day those who were persistent in their pursuit of evil. And he sought to warn them as individuals, but of course the whole nation, that the folly of such would lead to its ultimate doom. On the other hand, he also sought to remind the people of the unchangeable nature of God and indeed his unwavering and unbending commitment to the promises that he had made to his people. And as this message of hope is ministered to the people, we do well to indeed focus our hearts and our minds upon that message of hope, for that is true today. For just as Micah reminded the people that despite the days of hardship and opposition that they were living through and indeed would face, God was ever faithful to his word, ever faithful to his commitment, ever faithful to his promise, so too that same message of hope prevails today. Micah's day, we see those who knew what it was to be the chosen people of God. Promises had been made even by the prophets of old and indeed these prophets of the current age that God had yet to fulfill. And Micah reminded them that he was unwavering in his commitment to fulfill them. But you and I, as we gather to get, to get together today in the knowledge of the truth that his unfailing commitment to us is exactly the same as it was to the people of Israel. 
then this book has much to teach us. For I believe that we live in times where I suggest to you that many have lost sight of this in recent days. We've lost sight of the truth that God's word is unchangeable and his commitment to his people is unchangeable. With all that is going on in our world and with all the uncertainty of the future, God is still in control. And is still as committed as ever to fulfilling all that he has promised to us. And he does desire in us and through us to do something great in our world. And we do well, brothers and sisters, this morning not to be consumed with and not to be conditioned by the narrative of this world, but to be guided by and encouraged in the truth of God's word. Micah ministered to a people who only knew God through what he had revealed to, to them through his prophets. They knew, of course, that in days to come, Messiah would arrive. He was anticipated. And indeed, if you turn across to Micah in the chapter 5, we see that Micah himself foretold the people of this fact. He says in verse 1, I gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thy Bethlehem, Epaphra, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Oh, he reminded them of the great promise that God had already given, but here reiterated in the days of Micah that Messiah would come. That Messiah would come forth, that great deliverer, that great promised one of God. The prophets also, of course, spoke of the immediate deliverance from oppression that the people desired in days of captivity. They knew that the, southern, or the northern kingdom by now was in Assyrian captivity. And in days to come, the southern kingdom too would find their place in captivity. And so the prophet's message, not only here in Micah, but other prophets following, was, of course, the promise of deliverance in the immediate that God was going to deliver them from their immediate circumstances and provide them even that way out from oppression and captivity. And then there was the focus to Messiah and then the focus to the coming kingdom of Christ. And so Micah and his contemporaries ministered a message of hope to people who saw the plan of God simply in three stages. Deliverance from their immediate captivity, the promise of Messiah to come and then the kingdom of Christ. But what they have failed to see, what they indeed were unable to see, was, of course, the very days through which you and I are living. For as these men delivered their message, they delivered that a hope of deliverance, immediate deliverance from captivity, the promise of coming Messiah, the ushering in of the kingdom of age. But thus the enslaved Jew, the worried Jew, the anxious Jew, even the Jew who knew that he or she was a worthy recipient of the wrath and the judgment of God, knew that better days were coming, knew that better plans were in place and that Christ would prevail. But through it all, they could not see, they failed to see the days in which you and I live, that which the word of God describes as the mystery, the mystery of the church. In verse, verses 1 to 8 of, of chapter 4, the Bible tells us, In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain. It shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow onto it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many people, rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What's that speaking of? It's speaking of days yet to come. The promise of true peace on earth as Messiah rules and reigns. 
tells us in verse 4, They shall sit every man under his vine, under his fig tree. None shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them. In Mount Zion, from henceforth, even forever and ever. What's that speaking of? It is, of course, speaking of the regathering of the Jew. The establishment of Christ's kingdom as he rules and reigns over the world. But yes, also over the Jewish nation with the great moment of victory. Thy tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. Even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Zion. Jerusalem, And so we see clearly through this message that Micah is communicating the truth that the Jews of those days, they saw, the ch- they saw, of course, before the church, Messiah coming. They saw after the church when Christ would rule and reign, the tribulation and then the kingdom. But what they did not see was the age of grace that you and I are living in, the time whenever God called here a mystery, the days in which you and I are living through right now, here at the very end of this mystery. God would have us surely to be the same people of hope that he expected the Jewish people to be in those days. They didn't see all that you and I have experienced. They didn't know the real blessings that the church has even passed in down through the ages since its institution with Christ and its disciples. No, they did not see. They failed to see. They could not see. But you and I rejoice in the hope of what they rejoiced in, of what they hoped for, the true coming of Messiah to rule and reign in this world. And surely in our day, surely in our age, God would have us to be filled with even greater hope than the people of old. The people of boldness are we not to be. The people of courage. The people not carved down by the circumstances of this world. Not accepting defeat because of the increased manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist all around. But a strong people. Bold and courageous because we know the sure and the certain fact that one day Christ will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and we will rule and reign with him. A friend, if the exiled Jew was to take heart and courage from the promise of God, then I tell you that as they anticipate it someday, then you and I must and take heart and encourage today in this world in which we live because our redemption draweth nigh. He is coming again. He is. We come to this chapter 6 this morning. And we do so, I trust, having already established that Micah is God's voice to God's people. And I suggest to you as we come to chapter 6, that we come to a chapter that is as relevant today as it was in the days of Judah. I say this because you and I face an enemy just as powerful as the Assyrian Empire which threatened the people of Judah in Micah's day. If you remember anything from our study in Hezekiah or indeed your own knowledge of the events that unfold, you know that that mighty army marched up to the very gates of Jerusalem. They were an army who had overthrown many other dynasties in that part of the world at that time. They had been able to go and to uh, war and to make war at will and to win the victory each and every time. And as they stood before that great city and as the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah beheld their might, beheld their power, beheld their numbers. They surely were filled with fear and anxiety within. But you know, as mighty and as powerful, as ferocious as the Assyrians were, our enemy is, of course, the world. And that is an enemy today that has at its disposal the same might, if not more might. The same power, if not more power. 
than the Assyrian Empire ever had in the days of Micah. And the world wants nothing else than the ultimate defeat and downfall of the people of God and of the church of Jesus Christ in this age. And just as Sennacherib and his cohorts did in those days, they seek to do it by instilling fear within the people of God and instilling a message that God is defeated. And the Bible tells us of a world in which, of course, the people of Judah face that fear. And truly, as we see events play out in our world today, we see that the desire of the world, our enemy, is exactly the same. They want us to live in fear. They want us to believe that God, the Bible, God appointed leadership of local churches that they don't have the answers for current problems. They want to dictate to us how we should worship. They want to dictate to us how we should serve, how we should live as Christians here below. And so they come with the might of their institutions. They come with their puffed up knowledge of their scholars, the lies of their agenda. And just like the Assyrian Empire did outside the wall of Jerusalem, they have one intent to make you scared. To make the church scared. To make the people of God turn on God. To turn on their leaders. To make the people of God give in, give up, or give off. And so they say, as Sennacherib did, do you think that God will protect you? Do you think that God will preserve you whenever we know better? Only by doing what we say will your life be spared. We gather today, and I appreciate that many of us are still fearful. Many of us are still anxious. But I tell you, God has a message for us today. It's found in verse 8. And it's simply that little phrase that's found buried in the heart of the verse. What doth the Lord require of thee? What doth the Lord require of thee? And friend, today I encourage you, don't read this. And don't make the mistake of seeking to tell other people what God requires of them. For as I seek to deliver the rest of this message, may God protect me from telling you what you must do. But rather, may we all make this personal and simply say, what does God require of me? What does God require of me? Today is a lunch pad for a new series that simply is entitled, What Does God Require of Me? And I'll try, uh, with God's help, to answer from the word of God this inquiry. And to show what is required of each of us as we journey through life. We're going to travel to many different parts of the Bible in order to answer it. But today we stick to this chapter of Micah and seek to draw from it as we exegete some of these verses. The truth of the context of this question. What doth God require of me notice with me firstly the basis of the question why was this question ever asked you back up to verse 1 it tells us here now what the lord saith arise contend before the mountains let the hills hear thy voice hear ye o mountains the lord lord's controversy and ye strong foundations of the earth for the lord hath a controversy with his people And all that we need to know about the reason as to why this question was ever asked and to why it is still being asked today, what does the Lord require of me? It's because the Lord has a controversy with his people. There was something that was evidently wrong in the relationship that existed between God and the people of Judah. There was something that was evidently wrong in their most meaningful and indeed their most important relationship of all. In verse 3, the Lord goes on to elaborate upon this controversy and he says, O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. 
And Micah is an expert right throughout this little book of prophecy of holding almost like a courtroom drama before the people and bringing them to the witness stand and also then and calling the witness of God against the people. And here is an example of it for us. He seeks to elaborate upon the question that he has asked and upon the statement that he has made. The Lord hath a controversy with you. He calls him to the witness stand and he says, What have I done unto you? Why have I ever wearied you? And remember, this is the Lord asking the people as he ministered through his servant Micah, as he seeks to minister to their heart, as he seeks them to respond to the question, what do I require of you? He's saying to them, why are you in this current predicament? Why is the relationship between us so marred, so changed, and so distant from the reality of which I desire? What have I ever done to you? Points to the weariness of the people. They had become weary of being God's people. Weary of living for God. Weary of living different in the world. In verse 5 he goes on to say, Oh my people remember. He charges them with forgetfulness. They were people who had forgot what God had done in their past. And you reflect upon the truth of the nation of Israel. And what are we reflecting on? We're reflecting on a people who were chosen by God. A people whom God made to be into a great nation. A people who were delivered from the oppression and the bondage of Egypt. A people who were led, guided and fed in the wilderness. A people who were led and promised into the promised land just as God said they would be. A people who were protected and indeed delivered from many tight spots in that promised land. A people who then went on to to do that which was right in their own eyes. But yet every time God raised up a deliverer. A people to whom God gave godly kings. A people to whom God continued to provide divine protection to the point in King Solomon's reign whenever all their enemies were still and silent. Such was the power, the might and the protection that he afforded. And he says unto them, what have I ever done? Have you forgotten? Their weariness, you see, had saw them pursue other gods. Seek out other help. And then in verse 13, he sums the whole condition up and he just says, because of your sins. You're sinful. Oh, you may think that you can excuse your current behavior. You may think that it's just a rational reaction to the circumstances of life you find yourself in, but at its heart, at its very heart, it's sin. It's not true that we can say the same today. God surely has a controversy with us. We live no doubt in the day of small things. But I challenge anyone this morning to say that we are seeing enough of the small things. Some might say, ah, but pastor, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Seasons come, seasons go. The tide comes in and the tide comes out. And all that is true. But I remind you that God hasn't changed. And I remind you that the message hasn't changed. And I remind you that the power and the capability of the message hasn't changed. And so we do well to remember that judgment must begin in the house of God. And I tell you from God's word this morning that God has a controversy with us. And before you look around at others, I remind you we're personalizing this whole thing. And so the word of God tells me today that God has a controversy with me. God has a controversy with you. Today, the same charges that Michael leveled at the people are true. There are sadly many Christians who are weary of God. Weary of being called to live separate from the world. Separated to God. They're weary of the preaching of the gospel. They're weary of observing the Lord's table. They're weary of following the Lord in the waters of baptism. They're weary of soul winning. They're weary of loving the brethren. 
And so the list goes on. And just as it was in the days of Judah, that weariness leads to divided affection. And many are pursuing the things of the world. They forget God. You reflect upon those you know, those you grew up with, those who you've had the opportunity, the pleasure of sitting with in meetings just like this, of breaking bread with. But where are they today? Some perhaps not even in church, any church. They forgot God. No longer do they attend the house of God. No longer do they read their Bible. No longer do they partake of the bread and the cup. No longer do they give to the work of God. And oh, so easily they blame this one or that one. But ultimately they have forgot God. And without a shadow of a doubt, God looks at me this morning. And without a shadow of a doubt, God looks at you. And he sees in our lives sins that are undealt with. He sees sins in our church that are undealt with. He sees sins in our nation that are undealt with. And so he says, I have a controversy with you. I have here a statement that was prepared in the Isle of Hebrides by a presbytery of local churches in the days that immediately preceded the great blessed and effectual ministry of Duncan Campbell. It tells us here that the island of Lewis has been the scene of a very gracious movement of the Spirit of the Lord. The breath of revival has been felt. Communities have been conscious of the mighty impact of God. This island has, in days past, experienced seasons of refreshing from the Lord. But as we reflect upon it now, the years of vital Christianity appear to be running low. The presbytery of the Isle of Lewis have taken into consideration the low state of vital religion within their own bounds and throughout the land generally. And call upon their faithful people and all their congregations to take a serious view of the present dispensation of divine displeasure manifested not only in the chaotic conditions of international politics, of domestic economics, of domestic situations and morality, but also and especially in the lack of spiritual power from the gospel. And to realize that these things plainly indicate that the Most High has a controversy with the nation. They note especially the growing carelessness towards Sabbath observance of public worship, the light regard of solemn vows and obligations to membership within the church, and to the light regard of even the solemnity of the ordinances of the church, especially that of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They tend to become in many cases an offence to God rather than the means of grace to the recipients and the spreading abroad of the spirit of pleasure which has taken such a hold of the younger generation. And all regard for anything higher appears with very few exceptions to being utterly dismissed from their thoughts. The presbytery affectionately plead with their people, especially with the youth of their church, to take these matters to heart and to make serious inquiry as to what must be the end should there be no repentance. And they call upon every individual as before God to examine his or her life in light of that responsibility which pertains to us all, that happily in the divine mercy we may be visited with the spirit of repentance and may turn again unto the Lord whom we have so grieved with our iniquities and waywardness. Especially they would warn their young people of the devil's man traps, the cinema, the public house, the free house, the dance, and encourage all to return to the Lord. That was written, of course, many years ago by different people in a different age. But could that not be true today? The Lord hath a controversy with us. Time has gone this morning and so we'll continue our thoughts on this message tonight and we'll look further at the response to the question and God's desire from the question. But as we conclude our thoughts this morning, may we realize that God doth hath a controversy. And we do well to seek the Lord.